What's up, guys? Rick from DFS On Demand here with a preview for the week one of the NFL. I can't believe it's already here. Um, probably the most exciting time of the year. A lot of new players are going to be coming on to these daily fantasy sites um, completely unprepared for what is about to happen to them. So we're looking to try to take advantage of those players. Um, we will talk about some of the plays each week that I think are the most interesting. So if you've seen any of my video series before, that's kind of the structure of how we do this. We'll go position by position. I will preface this entire video series, all of these previews, but this one, this one particularly with it's week one. We don't have any 2017 data. So we're going to be looking a lot at last season. We're going to be making a few more assumptions than I would like to. I like to let the, the data make some decisions, but it's 2017. We haven't played a single regular season game yet. So bear with me as we go through this. Um, all of the tools that you see me use today, they're available on DFS On Demand. Again, they're going to be changing um, very often because we're going to get more data for this season and I'm going to be building new things and I'm going to take your feedback and all that stuff. So without further ado, let's jump right into the player pool for week one of the NFL season. I have the lobby up here for the Millionaire Maker, which if you remember is just the Sunday game. So this is not the Thursday night game and it's not the two Monday night football games, but still plenty of action, plenty of games to choose from here. So let's start the quarterback position. I was actually pretty interested to see that Ben Roethlisberger is the most expensive player or most expensive quarterback on the slate, but it makes sense. They're playing Cleveland. Um, you know, it's a, it's a high powered offense. They're getting Le'Veon Bell back, which we'll talk about here momentarily. Um, but I think at 7,300, there's probably a few better options than Big Ben. Um, I'm looking down here at Matt Ryan, the reigning MVP who threw for nearly 5,000 yards last season, something like 38, 39 touchdowns, um, essentially has all of his weapons. Uh, to gear up for this year. He probably has a bad taste in his mouth after uh, blowing the Super Bowl, if you want to put a little narrative to it. And he's going to be facing the Chicago Bears secondary, which was um, one of the worst in the league last year. This game, I believe, has the highest total on the slate, something like 51 points set by Vegas. The Falcons are a seven-point favorite, so Matt Ryan, to me, um, is clearly one of the best options on the slate as far as quarterback goes. I think he's safe to plug into your cash games, even as the upside for GPPs. However, if you've watched this video series, you'll know that my mentality is probably more contrarian than most. I like to go against the grain. I like to... Um, I do play a lot of GPPs, so that's where a lot of my analysis is going to end up coming from. I'm looking at Russell Wilson as being um, the guy that I will probably have the most exposure to. So what you're going to get with Russell Wilson, and let's pull up his game logs here. So again, this is just a, a tool. This is a game log tool that I have on DFSOnDemand.com. Let me get myself out of the way. So here's Russell Wilson. And um, I can actually sort these. These are all of his games last year, and I can sort them. And you can see, you know, 20 or more DraftKings points in what? Four of the last five games that he played last season. And it was a volatile year for Russell Wilson. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. Um, it, it was boom or bust week in, week out. I rostered a lot of him, and you were, you were doing a lot of guessing. Well, if there's any week to play Russell Wilson, this certainly seems like the one. Remember his... His receiving core was battling, battling injury last year. There was reports that maybe he was injured. Well, they've had the whole offseason to get healthy. He's facing Green Bay, which gave up the most DraftKings points to opposing quarterbacks last season. And I pulled this up. Um, I'm not sure I have it handy, but the, the over-under from Vegas on this game is 50. I went back, and that was from covers, and I went through six years of covers, regular season history for the Seahawks. And there has not been a game with a total that high in at least the last six years. I didn't go back any further than that. It could be a lot longer. But basically in this Russell Wilson era, we're getting the highest Vegas total against a team that's going to give up a ton of points to opposing um, quarterbacks. Russell Wilson is still certainly a dual threat. He can kill you through the air and he can kill you on the ground. So um, to me, that is just going to be someone that I'm going to be rostering quite a bit of for this week. If you're looking for some cheaper options, 
we'll scroll down here, and I think that Carson Wentz makes sense. Again, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel yet. We haven't seen any of these guys in a regular season game yet. But Carson Wentz has a massive arm. He's the type of – he has the ability to essentially gunsling. And he can throw it all over the yard. He's getting a great matchup with Washington, which was a bottom five defense against quarterbacks last year. And you're looking for Wentz to take that additional step, right? It's now his second season. You're looking for him to be much more comfortable in the offense. You're looking for him to make an impact very early in the season. He adds a weapon named Alshon Jeffrey to his receiving core. You expect Zach Ertz to, again, take another step forward in his young career, be more of a, a, a legitimate pass-catching threat. So Carson Wentz, I think, has the ingredients for someone who can pop off a few times here early um, during this 2017 season. Um, those are the three guys that I'll probably have the most exposure to. Um, other than that, I think Derek Carr is just fine. I think that, um, where is he? Andy Dalton presents an interesting option. So uh, let me do this real quick. Here's Andy Dalton. And what I want to see is really him on the road last year. And I'm actually pretty excited about this tool. You saw how quickly I can pull up game logs now instead of sorting through. 50,000 rows of a spreadsheet. But here's Andy Dalton on the road last year. And what I'm looking at here are the sheer number of pass attempts that he had. You know, no less than 28 in any game. Half the games he threw 41 or more times, um, including against the Baltimore Ravens, who he's going to be taking, uh, taking on this week. To me, this is just a Cincinnati Bengals team that is really not good enough to run away with the game on the road or they're going to be trailing a lot on the road. So when you have Andy Dalton throwing it 40, 50 times, um, you know, I'll take my chances with those, with those fantasy points because it's, it's a lot about sheer volume and opportunity, especially here in week one. All right, running backs. So I'm not worried about Le'Veon Bell just stepping back onto the field for – um, for training camp, basically just comes back out right a couple days ago. Um, Le'Veon Bell is the best running back in football. I'm not sure it's that close. Obviously, David Johnson is very close. But um, the amount that he is asked to do in this offense and the role that he plays is so insane. And you can see his point totals from last year. Um, you know what? I'll actually use some of these tools for you here. The sheer number of points that he can score. So here you go. I mean, these numbers are pretty insane. So this is a 33-point game right here in the middle. 27, 25, 54. The guy's floor is so high because he catches so many balls. Um, it's really remarkable what he's able to do in this offense and, and just in general. So I, I know that I've, I've heard rumblings around the industry like, oh, he's just stepping back on the field. He's not going to be conditioned, whatever, whatever. I'm not worried about it at all. It's Le'Veon Bell. Fire him up. Um, other than that, so there's there's obvious ones here like Darren McFadden starting for um, Ezekiel Elliott because Elliott's suspended, right? So McFadden's price is $6,100. Uh, DraftKings priced him up to that point. That's not particularly a steal. Um, I will probably not play Darren McFadden. Um, there's two guys here that I think are interesting. So Jordan Howard, I'm I'm on board for Jordan Howard this season. Um, the guy, again, it's volume. He has a ton of carries. This, to me, is not the weak. They're, they're pretty significant underdogs. Um, you know, I, I'm not thrilled to roster him against Atlanta. I think he's okay. I don't think he's great. But the guy above him, Jay Ajayi, is, to me, completely overlooked. Uh, here is a guy who is, what, the bell cow of this Miami Dolphins team. The the volume that he is capable of seeing on any given week. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. All right, so here we go. So here you can see Ajayi's um, usage last year. Uh, plenty of carries, and he can certainly handle his own um, out of the backfield as a receiver. But what to note here is there is no one pushing Ajayi for his job, okay? 
there's reports out of the preseason that he's getting a lot of goal line work, which are and third down work, which he may have not have gotten last year. So I actually think that there is a possibility that he gets more opportunity and more usage for this Miami, this 2017 Miami Dolphins team than he did last year. Now I will say, if we look at his profile here, so this is player profile, um, it is pretty volatile. So you can see started out very slow to the season. Went nuts, um, you know, weeks, what's that, five, six, seven, eight. Um, then he had a little bit of a lull and, you know, pops back up again towards the end of the year. So th I think that's reasonable for what you're going to expect out of Ajayi. I think he's going to have a handful of massive games. But I would say my my opinion is he probably gets more consistent this year. Maybe he loses out on some of this ceiling that he has, but I bet you his floor gets a little bit higher because I think he's going to get a lot of these um, high leverage, high valuable opportunities near the goal line that he may not have seen in the past. On the same page, uh, let me see if I can find him. So there's a couple here. I mean, uh, the rookies, uh, listen, in GPPs, you can essentially co convince me of anything in a GPP. You can convince me to run out Leonard Fournette or Christian McCaffrey if I'm playing any type of cash game, you probably have to wait and see first. We have no idea how these guys are going to be used. Um, I think that Lamar Miller is a pretty good price at $5,100. What do we know about this Houston Texas Texans team? Uh, we know that they want to run the ball down your throat. And Lamar Miller is another guy where he's probably not going to get pushed by Alfred Blue or like anybody else who would possibly be behind him this year. Um, I just think as long as he stays healthy, he's legitimately a chance to get 25 or 30 carries a game. So uh, Le Miller, Le Lamar Miller is popping up on my radar. If you need to go lower than that, um, you're probably in big trouble. I mean, I could make some outside arguments for LeGarrette Blunt or Frank Gore kind of because they're just known entities of, of what you might get out of them, but I'm not thrilled to roster any of those guys. All right, wide receivers. Um, so this is where it's the deepest. Um, so you mostly know what you're getting out of these guys at the top. Antonio Brown, you know what you're getting, right? He's going to be the number one target on a high-powered offense against the Cleveland Browns team. You should roster him as much as you can. Julio Jones already talks about Matt Ryan. I mean, these are guys... You should be rostering liberally every chance that you get. A.J. Green, um, we talked about Andy Dalton going overlooked. A.J. Green is a guy who also often goes overlooked, especially because he missed the last, what, six or seven weeks of the season last year. Uh, but before that, we'll look at this together. Let's look at A.J. Green together here. A.J. Green... In the, what is this, uh, basically four, eight, nine weeks that he played last year, scored 30 or more DraftKings points, and actually you could say 33 or more DraftKings points in essentially half the games he played. Um, it was pretty unbelievable. So A.J. Green is one of these border, I mean, first of all, he's an elite wide receiver, but he's like it's like the three at the top. It's like Julio, Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham, and then the rest of everyone else. And AJ's, AJ Green is like the best of everyone else. Um, you know, injured last year, having an having a great year before that. We, we already talked about Andy Dalton on the road and how the Bengals, like, are probably going to throw the ball 40 times in this game. And if you're throwing it 40 times, AJ Green is probably seeing a ton of those targets. So um, I like him a lot. Amari Cooper against the terrible Tennessee Titans defense. I wish I had, maybe it's in here. Um, I don't know if I have it in here, but if you go back and look at Amari Cooper's full preseason stats, like, like add them up. He, it was basically the equivalent of something like, I don't know how many snaps it was, but it was like a half of a game or something like that. And the dude went nuts in like, in what would have been the equivalent of a half a game. He had like, uh, 10 receptions for a hundred and something yards, a few touchdowns. Like it was, I, I don't know the exact numbers. I'll have to pull it up for you, but just an absolute monster, monster preseason from Amari Cooper, who is a app. He's a stud. Okay. He's a stud. Derek Carr is a stud. This is a very good team that has a lot to prove. 
and they're going to get to go out and beat up on the Tennessee Titans the first week of the season. Golden Tate, again, uh, the same premise as some other guys we talked about. Golden Tate is a, is a known entity. He plays for a team that is going to chuck it all over the yard as often as possible. Um, he plays on a team where he's going to be the guy seeing the bulk of the targets. And he's he, he's going to go nuts some weeks, right? So this is actually a pretty... Um, where is it? Here we go. A pretty fair matchup with Arizona, who allowed the fourth most draft Kings points to opposing wide receivers last year. And let's look up Golden Tate together. All right, so here's Golden Tate, if you can see this. So we'll sort by, uh, let's sort by the weeks of the year. How about that? Am I clicking it? There we go. All right, so you can see, um, essentially a lock <laughs> for double-digit targets, right? Like, there's probably not that many guys in the league who are averaging as many targets as Golden Tate in this price range. Um, so, again, you know what you're going to get. They're going to chuck it up to him early and often. I'm willing to invest on Golden Tate this week. Going down the list, there's a few guys I think are worth pointing out. Um, Michael Crabtree across from Amari Cooper. I think there's plenty of action to go around. Alshon Jeffrey uh, will probably be um, a pretty highly owned on a new offense, but that's a, that's a really good price. The two Green Bay wide receivers trying to figure out which one's going to go off every week is going to be pretty annoying, but Randall Cobb and Devontae Adams, I think, um, are someone's going to have to fill the role of the number two uh, wide receiver for Aaron Rodgers, and we've seen that he can keep he can keep three wide receivers relevant fantasy wise. So I think you're fine there. Then you start getting down the list, and I know there's at least a few guys. Oh, okay, Corey Davis. So it might not be week one, it might not be week two, but I'll probably be investing in Corey Davis a lot this year. Go back and look at his college stats. It's it's a reason why he was high, highly drafted, or, or at least the, the film. The dude's legit. He's going to have a lot of opportunity, right? He's playing for a team that is not only terrible, um, which means they're going to be trailing in a lot of games, which means they're going to be throwing a lot to keep up. They also have a dynamic quarterback. So he could play for a bad team. He could play for Cleveland, which is a bad team that has to throw a lot to stay in games, and they have no quarterback. But he doesn't. He plays for Tennessee, which makes him fantasy relevant because he has a dynamic quarterback named Marcus Mariota who has shown flashes at times of at least fantasy production, right? Like he could throw for five five touchdowns. And, and Corey Davis is immediately plugged in as his number one threat on a team that's probably going to have to chuck it all over the yard. So um, those are really the type of situations that we're looking for. Uh, not only season long, but trying to pick you know different weeks where we're gonna where we're gonna want to roster these guys and four thousand dollar investment on on Corey Davis, who right by all accounts is he the number one wide receiver? He, he's gonna have to be um, four thousand dollars for a number one wide receiver is a, is a pretty good price to pay. And then we'll wrap it up here with the tight end position, which I think is just absolutely brutal. Um, I'm not thrilled to roster. Any of these guys. I mean, I, I understand Greg Olson at 6,200 just because he's the best one on the slate. I have to be interested in Jimmy Graham because of everything that we talked about with Russell Wilson. Um, getting down towards the red zone, Jimmy Graham is obviously always going to be a threat in the red zone. This game has a total of 50. I think it's only a three-point spread. So, I mean, they're, Vegas is expecting a lot of fireworks in this game. So if I like Russell Wilson, I probably have to like his pass catchers, which include guys like Jimmy Graham. Um, Zach Ertz, you heard me mention a little bit earlier. Because we, like, let's look at this. Hold on, let me see if I can do this real quick. Um, yeah, player profile. Sorry, I'm still getting a little used to these tools as well. Look at the finish to Zach Ertz's season last year. Okay, so we, so as a whole... He averaged 12 and a half DraftKings points per game. The first eight weeks of the season, he averaged 5.7, and the last eight weeks of the season, he averaged 16.3. So I'll show you that whole chart again. Zach Ertz trending upwards, which makes sense with a rookie quarterback who's trying to figure out who his 
um, you know, who his guys are, right? Like trying to get a system underneath his belt, trying to trying to build chemistry with these players, and Zach Ertz is clearly trending in the right direction. Of course, you throw Alshon Jeffrey into the mix, that's probably going to take some targets away from him, but Zach Ertz, to me, is a candidate to break out this year just because of the situation that he's in. So um, I think that's worth, uh, what is he, 50, or I'm sorry, 3,500, which is, what's that, the min? Basically, min price, $3,500. Um, so those are probably the only, or sorry, 2,500 is the min. Um, those are probably the only two guys that I'm really going to roster heavily. I will mix in Jason Witten. I will miss in Jack Doyle. I wish Andrew Luck was playing. So maybe I'll wait on Jack Doyle a couple weeks. Um, I'll mix in both Tampa Bay tight ends, Cameron Brait, OJ Howard. I think those are both decent options kind of in the red zone, but Ertz and um, Jimmy Graham are probably the guys I'll have the most exposure to. So there you go. Week one in the NFL. We've been waiting for it. Um, glad you're here. Looking forward to another great season. You can find all these tools and information. It's DFSOnDemand.com. I got a bunch of stuff up there, and it will be changing constantly as we get more data. So um, I hope you guys enjoy. If you have any questions or comments, uh, tweet me. It's at DFSOnDemand, or leave a comment below. Talk to you guys soon. See ya.